Hi. So yesterday we talked about how we were set up to fail and how people who study the 21st century and humanity in general will be shocked at how badly we failed given the resources that we had. It's a bit like the opening episode of Star Trek Next Generation. In that episode, Q shows up and lambastes Captain Picard for humanity's record throughout history. And it's still going to be difficult to figure out where we went wrong, especially out of context. So the reason I'm doing these videos is to try to help establish some sort of context, at least from one person's perspective. And yesterday we talked about how we were set up to fail, how post-World War II, the collapse of civility worldwide led to, well, it led to homicides and murders and bombs and the kind of things that seem incompatible with a stable civilization. And so, post-World War II, the framework that was designed, again, this was an intentional design, was to separate human beings based on either race or religion. It didn't just happen in the United States. It happened all over the world. So you look at post-World War II. Remember, World War II didn't really end in 1945. We were taught that it ended in, in 1945, that the war, the timeline of the war, was only between 1939 and 1945. That's not true. The war continued because militaries all over the world were trying to protect their investments overseas. So one example of that would be uh, the Dutch actually kidnapped the future, I believe future president of Indonesia and escorted him to Jogja, Jogjakarta. And essentially just held him captive. And the Dutch, of course, had invested substantially in Indonesia. They may have thought that they lost this idea of colonial superiority, but they weren't quite willing to give up the financial investments that accompanied the idea of colonial superiority. And this didn't happen only in Indonesia. It happened all, all over the world. We're not taught about any of this, so it's very difficult for me to give you a lot of examples. But with respect to the separation, intentional separation of groups based on race and religion, that's an easy one. You have, again, post-World War II, in a very short time, about two to, two to three decades, you have the split off of Pakistan and India. So you have in, I believe, 1948, uh, you have the Muslims going to Pakistan and the Hindus staying in India, not all the Muslims left. See, see, this is the problem with having this kind of a design. Is it doesn't, it never works perfectly. You can never have perfect segregation. Human beings are too curious. And so, about even today, there are about 100 million Muslims in India. And so that obviously complicates the idea of, of segregation, at least in theory. So you, that's only one example. Uh, the creation of Israel was designed to separate the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims. The West Bank, I believe that's where Bethlehem is. That originally was meant for the Christians. Uh, the Gaza Strip was meant for the Muslims. And of course, Israel proper was meant for the Jews. You look at, obviously, I mean, that's just two examples right there. Um, Singapore. Singapore was where the non-Muslim Chinese went to after Malaysia. And so after Malaysia, you have the Malays staying in Malaysia. And for the most part, you have a Muslim country of Muslim Asians, just like Indonesia. And then you have the Chinese separating and going to Singapore. 
when it became apparent the British could not guarantee security between Singapore and Malaysia, Singapore became quote unquote independent. This occurred after racial riots, which of course confirmed again the prevailing paradigm at the time, which was the segregation or separation of the races and the religions were necessary for stability. There are many more examples. The point is that this separate but equal, or whatever it's called, depending on where you are, this idea was well-intentioned. It was designed to provide investor stability. At a time when you had chaos all over the world, people needed jobs, you had refugees all over the world that had no place to go and had no place to work, and so on and so forth. So the idea after, post, after World War II, despite the fact that the war didn't end in 1945, it kept going, was that you were going, you were going to create a world that revolved around investor stability that would allow a trickle down of technological innovations to the whole world. And it's worked. For the most part, wherever you are, in a country that was on the side of the victors, and actually even at this point, the losers of World War II, because of all the different investments made by all the different banks, all the different financial institutions that were backed up by governments all over the world, you, pretty, you have had a significant amount of technology and techno technological innovation in a very short time. And, and a lot of that has trickled down to the general public. So in, in a sense, we, this group, of human, this group of human beings in this time period in history, were subjected to the ideas of stability and technological progress over the idea of cultural progress, cultural understanding, and social cohesion. And the way that, again, all of this was justified is simply by looking at the chaos that occurred when we did not have things like clearly defined borders, a structured society that allowed investments to prosper, and so on and so forth. So I hope that you understand that when you study us and you look back on how miserably we failed, over and over again, right? We had problems with the problems in Germany. Uh, we, the problems in the United States came to a head. Of course, the United States is a majority German in ancestry or ethnicity. Uh, the president that was elected before was German-American. And again, you're gonna be tempted, I think, to sort of pick on the Germans without realizing that, well, first of all, Hitler was Austrian. And, you know, with all the different mixing going on, especially post-World War II, because people fought, fought back against segregation that was enshrined in law. And then when it wasn't enshrined in law, it was enshrined in the financial dealings all over the world in order to promote investor stability. So you're gonna be tempted to say, pick on the Germans again, but you have to understand that today, Germany is probably one of the most, or if not the most successful country in the entire world. So it can't be a German thing. It's a human thing. It's human nature that's got us into this, into this mess. It's the failure of the human will, despite what Faulkner said, William Faulkner said in his Nobel Prize speech. And in fact, I think he, he didn't say that mankind would be successful. He said that mankind will endure. So hopefully you now have a background that post-World War II, the chaos that came before it and after it, after 1945, was quelled in the most simplistic way possible, which was through segregation and then through an attempt 
to create separate but equal spheres all over the world. And on some level, it has worked. At least if you consider investments and technological progress to be your primary values. So sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. And again, if you want to criticize the human beings of this time period in the 21st century, remember what came before us. It wasn't as if this idea generated out of thin air. It came after massive conflict all over the world. And of course, conflict that was engineered by the, by the desire to either monopolize resources or to prevent somebody else from doing the same thing because there wasn't a stable structure in place that promoted peace. The United Nations, as I mentioned before, has been ineffective in the 21st century. It has to be invited by both parties in order to resolve a dispute. That's one of the reasons why disputes last so long. If you have the upper hand in a dispute, whether it's water rights or whether it's navigation right of way, you don't have to invite the United Nations in. You have the upper hand. There's no point in giving that up. Now, the consequences of that, intentional policy, first in law, and then buttressed and propagated by finance, the unintentional consequences of that policy include theories of racial superiority. So it turns out that when you segregate people in some neighborhoods which happen to be better at finance or investments than other neighborhoods, or at least utilizing those investments, those neighborhoods start to look around and begin the process of catering to the human ego that is really based on visual, on the visual. That is unfortunately one of the primary biological imperatives of the human race is that we're based oh, on something on visual, we're based on pattern seeking, based on the visual. And if you're in an environment that's unbeknownst to you, is designed for segregation, and you happen to be more successful than a neighborhood 20 minutes away or 200 miles away, it's fairly easy to see that if the other neighborhood 200 miles away looks nothing like you and is poor and is asking for more investments to catch up, it's fairly obvious to see that in an environment where you have an ineffective financial system, an ineffective governance, in other words, some cities will be more honest and effective than others, depending on who was able to be boosted through the political process, which of course runs on money. It's just there's more private money now. In the old days, if you wanted to get into office in the United States, you had to be backed probably by the military or some other major institution. And as banks have taken over a lot of the political funding, they've created a competitor essentially to the government itself. So you, you put all these things together and suddenly that neighborhood that's doing well, 200 miles away, that looks, say, all, all white, all Christian, that neighborhood 200 miles away looks at another neighborhood that's not doing so well, that happens to be black, and perhaps, even if they're Christian, let's say they're not, and suddenly you can see how easy it is to ascribe cultural values to the success of one neighborhood over the other. It never starts out as a racial issue. It always starts out as those people don't have the same values as we do. And so you have this whole motif of criticizing people based on their actions without considering either historical context or financial and political mismanagement. Political and financial mismanagement are the same thing. They go together. And as, as I said before, sometimes it's having too much money is not a good thing. It may be as bad as having too little money. 
is because if you have too much money, you make too many compromises, and eventually that you never establish a foundation that endures. And so the effect of segregation, which was unintentional, was to actually perpetuate the very superiority, ideological arguments of superiority that were intended to be stamped out post-World War II. In other words, they made a comeback because of the way that things were set up in order to avoid another World War II. You see the problem? And perhaps one of the reasons that happened is because you had this idea that Germany post-World War I and World War II was burdened by debt, and as a result of having poor economic choices available, descended into ideological fanaticism. And so you can see how the resolution of that would be if we just separate these people and give them investments and then trickle down technology, people will feel secure, they will feel safe, and they will feel as if progress is being made. And we won't have to worry about all these other cultural issues. We can avoid them altogether and create a separate but equal paradigm. But you can't do that. Human beings are too curious. And what's actually happened is exactly what I said before, which is that we were set up to fail unintentionally. The solution to the chaos that led to World War II has now created a similar cycle because human nature is constant or has been constant throughout history. So now, I, hopefully we've understood that these, that you can't have social cohesion with segregation. Not possible. And so that's what we've tried. So we've lost social cohesion and we've, we've attempted to paper over that failure with investments under a paradigm that prioritized investor stability. And it worked. Remember, up until 2008, 2009, where you had a, well, actually, there's been multiple financial cri crises all over the world. You had 1996, 1997, 1998, Asian financial crisis. You had, uh, gosh, you know, you had all these intermittent catastrophes, all of which were solved. So in 2008, 2009, you had a massive amount of debt, and that that debt was not tied into a foundation of accurate data. And what ended up happening was, as of today, we now have more debt in the United States and possibly, and probably in the whole world than we did before the 2008-2009 financial crisis. If that sounds like a failure, it is, but only to some extent. It's a failure because we're repeating history, but it's also a success because we haven't descended into total chaos. Remember that Germany, which, which suffered massive unemployment and had massive debt, became a militaristic, racist country. That's only happened to some extent in the United States. It's only happened to some extent after a financial crisis. And the reason is because post-World War II, we created the framework to bounce back from a financial crisis, but not necessarily from a crisis of social cohesion. Not necessarily from a crisis of educational failure or a crisis of political failure. And it turns out that if you have a paradigm that prioritizes money and technology, that you end up exactly where you were before World War II. Because we tend to forget this, but the Germans under Adolf Hitler in the 1930s and 40s, up until the very end, or shortly before the very end, were the world leaders in science and technology. They invented the, Uber, the submarine, essentially. They, you know, it was just a constant sort of move push towards technological progress. 
So hopefully we understand, number one, that we were set up to fail, and number two, that the unintentional consequences of attempting to avoid another World War II has succeeded on some levels, but also failed on other levels. In other words, we succeeded in being able to bounce back from a financial crisis, but at the expense of social cohesion. We haven't quite figured out a way to bounce back from a failure of social cohesion because we've never fixed a foundational issue, that foundational crack of segregation. So, the other problem that occurs when you implement segregation is that it makes it a little bit too easy to manufacture heroes and outliers. So I mentioned before, yesterday, I mentioned this idea that you've got a police department that regulates a city and that regulates just resident, residential roads. If the federal government starts building highways nearby, you can then open up a new department, a highway patrol that then is dedicated to patrolling that new area. And one of the reasons that's done is, is to promote jobs. In other words, you have that progress, that technological progress. You figured out how to build highways where before you only knew how to build roads. And now you've got progress, but also you have jobs. So you're trying to get as far away from World War II as possible, as far away from unemployment as possible. That's one of the reasons, that's one of the ways that we try to fix the problems or avoid the problems of the past. The problem is that when you operate in silos, which is a necessary consequence of segregation, which again is perpetuated in all areas of, areas of life, including economics, even how you patrol the roads, when you have that kind of segregation, there's a, temp there's a temptation, especially if you're the government, to bootstrap and justify your funding by promoting outliers. And so rather than fix the foundational problem, or rather than strive for efficiency, which would, which would counter the aim of creating more jobs, and therefore, from an investor's mindset, more stability, what ends up happening is you start promoting, say, one person and you start you know, feeding the newspapers a story about this person and then you start paying newspapers indirectly to publish stories about this person and then you create role models. The problem is those role models have been generated in a bubble. If there, even if there is some overlap between this new department and the old one that existed before it, there isn't necessarily that the checks and balances that you would think should exist. And so somebody who's handling the highway patrol might not know what goes on in a city police department and vice versa. And that essentially creates a situation where anybody can tell whatever story they want without natural checks and balances. And since journalists are not lawyers, it, it, and since even today you don't have transparency in court cases, um, you, don't, you certainly don't have transparency in criminal, on the criminal docket, we're starting to get to a position where we do have transparency on the civil docket, but there's no way, or in other words, it's because there are no natural checks and balances. We are now in an environment where it is uncertain that the government will be in a position where it wants to advertise its failures at the same time that it is, it is attempting to promote its successes in order to create role models to promote social stability. In my lifetime, when I was growing up, you know, I didn't really see anybody that looked like me in government. I didn't really see anybody that was like me in any way within the government or even in, in general media. And so um, one, of the, one of the ways that this country has attempted to fix that problem 
which undermines social cohesion, and the idea of universal values, and the idea of coming together as a society, guided by role models, has been to promote people into, pos into positions of power, and visible, visible positions of power, who are diverse. And again, the problem is you're not fixing the segregation issue. And one of the reasons you're not fixing it is, is because it's so easy just to promote one or two people from this segregated neighborhood that do well on a test score or in an athletic event and then boost that person into the public eye. You can then easily surround that person with helpers and then attempt to create a role model or at least manufacture one. And again, because this is all happening in the context of a still segregated society, you're going to end up in a position where because you're promoting color, well, you're going to end up in a position where you're promoting differences in a way that covers up your inability to acknowledge that the entire system is still based on segregation and has been for quite some time. And when you do it that way, you don't have the natural sex imbalances that would occur in a truly diverse society. So you wouldn't have, say, in that very simple example of, of the highway patrol versus the city police, you, I, you wouldn't really have a position where somebody in highway patrol would attempt to expose corruption within the city police department. They just wouldn't be in a position to do that. They wouldn't know what was going on in that other department. And as a result, you then end up in silos by design. Why? In part, because if you allow truly honest journalism, there's always a problem somewhere that, that will be uncovered. And if you have a system that's based not on social cohesion, but that's based on perpetuating economic stability, you can see how you will have a society where the journalists won't be able to help you until it's too late, until the, until the problems have seeped out of each stylo and into the general population, until it can't be covered up. So remember, what are the natural checks and balances? One of the problems with segregation has been that you just don't have them. So even if you have honest people in each siloed department, whether corporate or public, you've still created a society where those problems won't come to light because people won't have the expertise to either understand the problems in, that are happening nearby, again, five minutes away from where you are, or don't have an interest in exposing those problems under the assumption that, well, that's not my jurisdiction, that's theirs, they will fix it. And that they that supposed to, that were supposed to fix these problems were the judges and the lawyers. And that got papered over when you allowed government unions extensive power to the point where they were in a position to negotiate their own disciplinary standards. And so not only were government unions in a position where they would negotiate their own pay and their own contracts sitting next to or, or having somebody across the way that would be out in four years or maybe eight years while the union would be in power in theory as long as possible. You not only had that unequal bargaining power, but you also had a situation where you would allow people to set the terms of their own employment. And in the case of police misconduct, there was an officer in the Capitol, in the government building in Washington, D.C., that was shot as she was attempting to climb through a, uh, the broken glass of a door. And as she was trespassing, she was shot and killed. I believe she was, she was unarmed. And it turns out that if you, in order to prosecute that security 
personnel. The standard for prosecution is not objective. It's based on whether or not somebody in that officer's shoes at the time of the shooting that resulted in a homicide felt in fear of his or her life. And again, it's a subjective standard. I could, in order to create any sort of real checks and balances, it would have to be an objective standard. But to promote an environment where you have security that then protects the property, that then protects the investments, that then leads to more investments, that then leads to more jobs, that then cements the segregation that made it all possible. You have a standard that lets people with guns who are supposed to protect the general public feel free to use them. You can see how social cohesion matters. If you allow that kind of power within any sector, whether public or private, without social cohesion, things will fall apart. Eventually. It won't appear that way until the very end. Because the very element, segregation, that allowed these problems to be hidden has also allowed the very investments that got you to that point. So hopefully you can see now that we were set up to fail and that we're right back to where, where we were before. We're back to the same ideas that are trickling down through society about racial superiority, about cultural superiority. We're now probably behind in terms of any sort of real diversity because we've manufactured diversity based on public perception, based on each siloed area and each siloed department, boosting people into visible positions of power without actually fixing the underlying issues that would have otherwise allowed more people to be boosted in a more meaningful way. And all of this, the successes and the failures, have been made possible by a deliberate policy of segregation that was first called de jure, legal, by law, segregation, which then converted, as the lawyers fixed that problem, quote unquote, fixed it, it then converted into a financial situation where the same people that were helping make the laws simply shifted their money into a different environment or a different pot that allowed them to maintain the status quo. And it didn't look like to most people that we were still maintaining the status quo because in each stylo was boosting people that looked different and that hadn't been in positions of, positions of power before, even if they had the same ideas as before, even if their ideas were old and unoriginal. And the, the other result of this paradigm that is set up for failure is that you start to hear people talk about, especially the lawyers, talk about fixing the results without acknowledging the causes. Just listen to a speech by an African-American who grew up in segregated schools. And he was speaking of a lot of, a lot of issues, very inspirational. Not original, but very inspirational. He mentioned everything but segregation. He mentioned racism, he mentioned I mean, you, you mentioned the jailing system that in, in the United States is set up to maintain the image of the ruling class. God, I sound so uh, revolutionary when I say that. The image of the ruling class. That's not... <laughs> What's odd about all of this is I'm all for economic stability. I just happen to recognize that economics without sociology is meaningless. That's, and I'm not the first person to say that, right? That's Hernando de Soto, who identified all of this. 
And funny, he's, he called lawyers terrorists. He said that these guys are getting in my way. I've got all, I've figured out a way to fix all these economic problems and I can't get anything done. This is not a direct quote. He's far more refined than that. And the lawyers are getting in my way. So we call them terrorists. So again, you have these consistent patterns that if you're just paying attention are fairly obvious. But the person I was listening to happened to go to law school. And so he's not gonna be the one that criticizes the profession. It's what got him there in the first place. It was what gave him an audience in the first place to perpetuate the system that failed to fix segregation. It fixed it on paper as a court decision, Brown versus Board of Education, that was supposed to fix it. That was back in 1964. As recently as 10 years ago, I was, I was volunteering in a school, in a middle school, just 15 minutes away from here. It was one of the most segregated race places I've ever been to. The classroom was split between people of Mexican descent and Vietnamese descent. And <laughs> so again, one of the reasons that we failed is because the money that was designed to promote investor stability did a damn good job shining on this idea that the lawyers had ever fixed anything. That they had succeeded in actually creating checks and balances. And when you look at, the, look at these, these decisions, it looks great. You look at Brown versus Board of Education, it looks like things were solved. But of course, within this complex system, you have three different branches and they all have to be on the same page in order to make anything work. You're not gonna make anything work if the prevailing paradigm that's backed up by the money and by the funding is specifically designed to promote segregation and silos the entire time, regardless of what the lawyers and the judges do. When you look at it in that sense, that the judicial branch has completely failed and the executive branch aligned itself with the banks and essentially won its way, its culture, its values. And then you can't get, the legislature can't get anything done without the executive branch implementing it or at least protecting its rulings or its changes, you start to see that all over the world, we've always had, we've always been set up for a quote unquote strongman ruler, regardless of where you live. And the countries that have without propaganda, with less propaganda, embarked on a path favoring the executive over all other branches have been the most successful post-World War II. Now that you understand all this, it should be fairly obvious why China has done well. It should be fairly obvious why Singapore, which kicked out one of its <laughs> uh, crusading lawyers. <laughs> I believe that person might be in the United States now. I'm not sure, maybe Germany. They've all been successful. The countries that have been unsuccessful because they haven't been able to attract the money, because they haven't been able to protect the money under the paradigm that was preferred by the financial establishment, they've been unsuccessful. And I talked about this when I went down to Jackson, Mississippi, and I mentioned that even today you have clear, the clear markings of economic development that has cemented historical segregation based on race. And the new scourge of civilization is now economic segregation, driven by economic development, driven by a concentration of ownership, of existing ownership that continues to believe in segregation in order to protect its, its investments. So when you think about this idea that we've been taught that it's really communism or socialism against capitalism or all these other isms, when in fact, the one consistent metric in terms of quote unquote success has been countries that prefer the executive branch 
more power in order to attract investment. When that's the paradigm, and those have been the countries that have been successful, this result here today is not should not be unexpected. Now, I'm, I'm being... I mean, maybe a little bit unfair, right? Singapore uh, is diverse. It's deliberately, after the racial riots, figured out that social cohesion was an aspect it had to have in order to be successful. But it was a small country, so it had no choice. You can drive across the whole country, you know, probably in a few hours, assuming a straight line. So the smaller countries, it should also not be unexpected that the smaller countries which had no choice but to make social cohesion and sociology as part of their economic policy, have been wildly successful. And so smaller populations, even if they were diverse, have been wildly successful. You know, you've got Norway, you've got Singapore, and Norway isn't, isn't really diverse, but, you know, it's, it's accepted some refugees. Um, you just look around, right? The smaller countries have been places that have maximized, for the most part, or human, human potential. Overall, I'm not talking about outliers, I'm talking about overall. You know, overall, right now, if you had a veil of ignorance placed over you and you, and you didn't know who your parents were, you didn't know uh, how much money you would have when you were born and, and what color you'd be and so on, uh, and you had to pick between small, a small country and a big country, chances are, you know, you, you, I mean, you might miss out on China, which has been wildly successful over the last 20 years under an executive-driven model. Um, but for the most part, if you look at the, look at the smaller countries, um, Singapore, you know, Qatar, you look at all these little UAE, um, it, you might actually be better off, you know, picking a smaller country. Because you might get that Singapore, you might get, I mean, I'm sure there are small countries that are just unsuccessful, like maybe Kashmir. But of course, those are sandwiched in between neighbors that are, you know, battling for powers. And if you look at Kashmir, what is that? Post-World War II, right? You have a split that was designed to segregate the, the Hindus and the Muslims, and that country was caught in between. So again, to the extent that the smaller countries have been unsuccessful, it's because they've been caught in the tides of history under a segregation-based model. You put all these things together and everything makes sense, including the fact that we failed miserably and everything that happened in that Star Trek episode of The Next Generation, in that first episode with Q's criticism of humanity, putting humanity on trial, is still true today. We failed the trial. We failed the test.